so today we're going to be talking about longevity, which is effectively anti-aging, but I don't really want to say that because that conjures up pictures of big beefy muscle heads and a bunch of testosterone injections. This is more about aging gracefully, aging optimally, aging well, because it is possible now. Um, and I'm going to talk very in a very detailed way about a lot of the science and the, and the recent discoveries about longevity. Um, some of it's pretty technical, but my purpose is to try to give you actionable tools uh, that are now science-based that will help your health span uh, get longer. And a health span just means a good older life. I mean, we could all live forever, right, if we were plugged into a machine with a ventilator, but that's not a quality long life. So I'm really talking about longevity, which is quality aging optimal aging, which is what I'm all about. So uh, let's get going. I'm Dr. Meredith Warner, Warner Orthopedics and Wellness, and also one of the founders of Well Theory. And today we're gonna talk about longevity, which is one of my favorite topics. Um, I have a private practice orthopedic clinic in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but I also teach for LSU Orthopedics in New Orleans. So my day-to-day -day is spent with people in Louisiana, which you may or may not know, um, is one of the poorest states in the union and also one of the least healthy states. Uh, so we sort of seem to go back and forth with Mississippi every year as to who has the most obese, the most diabetics, the most cardiovascular death. I think that uh, I heard the other day one of the reps of a blood pressure med consistently wins all of his sales awards for the little trips they take in pharmaceuticals every year. Uh, he's in South Louisiana where the rates of hypertension are just massive and everyone's medicated. So my day-to-day -day is spent just trying to make people feel a little bit better on a daily basis um, and trying to talk to them about ways to extend their life and age gracefully and optimally it becomes a bit tricky when you're not in an academic ivory tower surrounded by wealthy PhDs. But I, I'm getting there and I think we found a lot of good actionable tools to help people not just live longer and have a longer lifespan and health span, but actually to feel better today because it's all tightly linked. So let's get going. All right, so let's talk about what is longevity. So I spent some time and looked up the various definitions of longevity. The dictionary definition is a long duration of individual life. But we already said maybe that's not exactly what we want, right? We want a long, sorry, more technical difficulties. Um, the Oxford Dictionary says long life or long existence or servants. So like you can have longevity in your career, for example. Dictionary.com says a long individual life, a great duration of individual life. Okay. And then this paper out of science, which was actually, I think the title was Unusual Human Genetics of Longevity. It went into all of the various different things that you need to think about, like geography, demography, culture, et cetera, and then how that plays into genetic variations for centenarians or people that live to be 100 or more. And in that, the term longevity was called the capability to survive past the average age of death. So none of this sounds, can we go to the next slide while you do that? Just real quick, I'll hold it. Sorry, we're trying to set up another mic. Um, so I put this in to talk about that, the capability to survive past the average age of death. I don't know if any of you saw Cocoon or remember Cocoon. It was a Ron Howard film, it was an awesome movie. I think it was back in the 80s. Um, and the concept was it was this old age community and they somehow had found from, I guess some aliens brought the technology, a way to extend the health span and get younger, stronger, be more vital, you know, go from playing pickleball to playing singles tennis on clay, things like that. It's a great movie, science fiction back in the day, but it's actually starting to become reality now. So I think we're entering the era of the real cocoon. Um, but again, in the day-to-day -day basis for a lot of people who can, you know, are just barely able to fill the gas tank nowadays, they can't make ends meet, certainly can't eat as healthy as they need to, can't get to bed when they need to. There's a lot of basic fundamental building blocks that need to be put in place just to feel good today. Because if you don't feel good today, why would you want your life to be extended by four to eight years or 20 years or 50 years, right? So that's kind of my purpose is to take everything we're learning in this world and kind of apply it to improving not just your future health span, but your current health span. So what do we think of when we think of aging? Pain, stiffness, loss of function, poor cognition, wrinkles, you can't see as well, you can't hear as well, all your hair falls out, 
And we assume this is inevitable because that's what we've been taught. And when I say we, I don't mean just you. I mean, a medical school, it's just assumed. In fact, I, I had a patient just yesterday who came to see me and he wondered what I thought about fatigue. He was get, just not able to do as much as he could before. He was getting tired and lacking endurance. And he told me his primary care told him, well, you're 72. It's just, it is what it is. I don't personally believe that. And I've got a lot of science to back what I believe. I don't think this is inevitable. And I don't think it's just because of the passage of time. So really, what is aging? Is it all this? No. So what is it? I think nowadays, just like obesity is not classified as a disease, but maybe it should be, aging is not classified as a disease, and maybe it should be. But I'll tell you this, the minute it gets classified as a disease, then it's all of the new innovations and all of the science and treatments that have that are going on that are allowing this expansion of knowledge in the wellness industry will be shut down because once it's called a disease, then we start getting into heavy regulations that we don't really need to advance this science. Um, so basically, what is it? It's a st stochastic process that leads to gradual alterations in biomolecules on the molecular level. That is what aging is. Changes on the DNA and protein levels, or changes of your DNA and protein levels might be a better term, that are the cause and consequence of our molecular clock. So I'm gonna talk about timing later, but the suprachiasmic nucleus in your brain is kind of your master clock regulator and, and is altered with levels of melatonin and cortisol, which are triggered by light, okay, or not triggered by light. Every cell in your body also has a series of genes, one of which is actually called the clock gene. Um, that regulates your daily functions and then your overtime functions. So the molecular clock is hugely important. You may have heard of telomeres. These are little um, repeating nucleotides at the end of a DNA molecule. So attrition or shortening of that is associated with long life, or sorry, short life. There've been a lot of research into that. Maybe if we could manage the telomeres, we could manage aging. That hasn't really fully panned out. Deletion of mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondria, you've heard me say before, is the engine of your cell. It's, a, it's um, a highly preserved organelle in eukaryotic or mammal cells and in plant cells and in insect cells and in worm cells, et cetera, et cetera. That is the refinery that converts the raw crude oil of food into the gas that runs an engine. It makes ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So if you delete the mitochondrial DNA or mutate it and damage it, that can cause aging. DNA methylation changes. So maybe you've heard the term epigenetics, epigenetic aging. What that means is you have your genes. So this shows you a picture of the genes. You have your DNA. That is what it is. What changes over time and what starts being changed even in the, uh, the pre-womb era. So like your grandmother's epigenetic changes can affect your intra-womb development, so on and so forth. The the certain DNA molecules will get methylated or unmethylated. So either a methyl group is added or taken off, and these will turn on certain genes and turn off certain genes. So actually, the DNA methylation is massively important in terms of aging. And in fact, today, and we'll talk about this very briefly at the end, there is something called an epigenetic clock. And you can actually send your DNA in, and they will count the methylations and tell you what your biological age is versus your chronological age. Steve Horvath is one of the scientists that first figured this out. Um, and it can be changed and people are starting to figure out ways to reverse aging. And that's what I'm talking about when I say the cocoon era. Sirtuins, I don't know if anybody's heard of sirtuins. There's seven of them that we're aware of now. These are extremely important little protein kind of enzyme structures in the cells that are very important in DNA repair, energetics, um, and then extending longevity and, and making sure we don't have the changes that we associate with aging that we already talked about. mTOR, which is active when we're in a very energy rich environment. It's, a, it's an anabolic sort of a enzyme or protein and it promotes growth and muscle building, et cetera. Sounds great, right? But you really don't want a lot of that if you wanna live long. You wanna always be in a state of stress and clean up. And we're gonna talk about why that's important. And then I personally think one of the main problems of why we feel bad today and have poor function later is the deposition of what are called advanced glycation end products. These are monster proteins that are made when free sugars are around amino acids and they glom together and form a glycated product. So you may have heard of the HbA1c or your A1c when you're a diabetic, which looks at 
how much sugar is glommed onto your red blood cell. And that's a way to see what your glycemic load was over the past three months. Well, the reason that you can see it on the red blood cells is because it's basically an advanced glycation end product on a red blood cell. And because red blood cells take three months to turn over, to die and go away and have a new one form, it gives you that average. So advanced glycation end products are not just happening on red blood cells, they're happening in your face. That's why we have wrinkles and that's why our skin collagen gets messed up. It's happening in your heart muscle, it's happening in your endothelial cells and your vascular lining. It's happening in every single piece of collagen in your body, tendon, ligament, cartilage, bone. And this is why we start to get stiff, why we start to have pain, why we have more reactive oxygen species and why nothing works right. And advanced glycation end products begin and end with sugar. So if you can keep your uh, glucose to a certain level, you won't form more than you should. Uh, and then if you can avoid eating as many of them, you won't either. So move on. Oh. Excuse me, I'll put that there. Okay, sorry guys. All right, so these are all of the potential sources of aging. All right. Okay, so there's another theory of aging, the evolutionary theory. So basically think of this, you've heard of Darwin, you've heard of natural selection, you've heard of evolution, only the strongest survive. So aging effectively means you bypass natural selection. So normally failures or the animals that failed would die, they'd be gone, right? And then you select the stronger and so on and so forth. Think about this, most animals like monkeys, rats, um, macaws, whatever, they don't really survive very long. Um, and so they don't survive to old age. We've never really had to deal with old age before. There's never been a reason for the genetic process of evolution to select for genes that favor a good long health span, right? So uh, that's why we're living longer. So we see things like wrinkles. We see things like frailty. We see things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. We see things like cancer where these were never seen before because people didn't live long enough. People were dying of cholera. People were dying of starvation, things like that. So we've kind of, you know, now we have clean water, got dental hygiene, we've got vaccinations. We've got a million different ways to extend our lives. Um, but now we're dealing with the consequence of skipping natural selection. So it's an inevitable byproduct, right? A aging is just, if you're going to not die, of course you're going to age. So I always tell people, well, the alternative to getting old is not so hot. Uh, so at this point, we just need to figure out how to make it better because we don't want it to go away, right? You don't want to not age. At least I don't. I want to age as long as, as long as science will let me. All right. So the hunt for longevity has been going on since time began, okay? 2,200 years ago, emperor, and I'm going to say this wrong, Qi Shin Hong, ordered a, natural, a national hunt. So like harnessed up all of his people and sent them to find the elixir of life. Clearly that didn't happen. However, he did bury 8,000 terracotta soldiers with him to help him continue that search into the future. I don't know what's happened with that particular search, but I can tell you in the US, we have certainly lengthened our lifespan. So now I think the average age, if you take out the variations from things like fentanyl overdose deaths and COVID, I think the average age is somewhere in the mid seventies, a little bit older for women, a little bit younger for men, um, but we have not increased our health span. So although people are living longer, there's more sarcopenia, loss of muscle, there's more frailty, there's more cancer. Uh, there's more diminished function, there's more isolation, there's more social depression and anxiety, things like that. So it's not necessarily better for most of us. Now, if you live in, you know, Berkeley, California, you're a PhD and you've got a ton of money because you're related to somebody that had a startup in the tech world, yeah, your long life's going to be amazing. But for most people uh, that can't, you know, it's hard to get day to day. This doesn't sound so good, but I'm going to tell you why it does sound good for you and how it's going to make your life today better. So the history of aging research, so this is kind of interesting. So again, people have not stopped looking for the secret to life or the Holy grail, so to speak. In the 1900s, scientists realized, look at these curves on the right, these um, graphs, x-axis x axis and y-axis, okay? So the percent survival is on the y-axis, uh, I'm getting it backwards, uh, the up-down axis, and so 100% is at top, so obviously at day zero, 100% are alive, right? And then you see this sort of similar curve, no matter what your particular creature type, okay? So what this shows you is, 
And it seems like duh, right? But in science, a lot of duh has to be proven before they can move on. Uh, the older group, that's when there was diminished survival percent, right? So we realize and prove that everything will die. It seems to be the same sort of curve. It's just compressed or extended uh, depending on the size of the, the creature or the animal. Uh, but we also realize that by altering certain things, epigenetics or two in activity, mTOR, um, telomere length, whatever, uh, we could we could push that curve out and or change the slope of that curve. And that's really what we're looking to do. We want the curve to go further to the right and we want the slope to be more gentle. Okay, so there have been some pretty amazing breakthroughs. Some of you may have heard of um, caloric restriction or time-restricted feeding. Uh, caloric restriction was actually found in 1935 by a scientist named Clive McKay. And he realized that when he was doing certain experiments, feeding rats, which is a, a common um, lab animal that is used to study things in the preclinical status before you go on to human clinical studies, uh -huh. he realized that feeding rats a diet with 20% fewer calories extended their life to a significant degree. And then that particular finding has now been repeated multiple times with multiple different organisms and work is ongoing right now in humans. So reducing caloric intake of what we consider to be normal or what you would eat if you always had food available, like what you would eat to the point of satiety, if we reduce that amount, we know we'll live longer and we know we'll feel better and we know that we'll have better function and better cognition. So this is a fact, and it's been proven over and over again. Now trying to convince people of that is a little bit difficult. Um, trying to break the food industry's insistence on three meals a day plus snacks is a little bit difficult. Drive down the street, see all of the easy fast foods and stuff. Um, but I think that maybe this will percolate probably in 10 years or so, you'll see fewer fast food restaurants, more healthy choice options, I hope. Um, because probably we all eat a bit too much if we want to live optimally and live longer. And I know that doesn't make sense right now, but it will. So we know now why it's, that's true. We did not know in 1935. Interestingly, I don't know if anybody's read the China study. I'm in the middle of reading it right now. This is one of the first, or I don't want to say the first, one of the largest, earliest epidemiological studies about nutrition and health. Uh, they went and studied rural Chinese uh, societies when that was allowed. Um, for a series of years and sort of monitored their diet, lifestyle, et cetera, and then figured out what contributes to their better long life because they do live longer and are more active and have better function than we do. Um, and the guy that wrote that, Campbell, Dr. Campbell, was one of Clive McKay's grad students. So that's pretty interesting. Um, it's sort of like this small group of people that are like propagating and it's growing a little bit bigger, but there's not a ton of scientists looking into it, but the ones that are doing this are doing some great work for us. So basically, caloric restriction decreases levels of amino acids. That turns off mTOR. Remember I told you mTOR sounds great, right? Like build, 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 protein, protein, make things bigger and stronger. Not true. You don't want all that done. What you want the energy of your cell going towards is cleaning up damaged DNA, cleaning up damaged proteins, fixing cell membranes, fixing receptors, and making sure all the proteins and amino acids fold correctly. 20% of the human genome is used to form enzymes. And if they don't fold properly because one point is mutated on the DNA, everything falls apart. So what you really want, you don't wanna keep building muscle, right? You don't wanna keep building fat. You want energy of your cell to go towards fixing that DNA and then cleaning up the mitochondria. So decreased food gets you into a stressful situation where that starts to happen. And then of course, decreased glucose, less less uh, glucose in your serum, reduces the number of advanced glycation end products. It increases this certain bioenergetic sensor called AMPK in your cell, which induces all of these cleanup activities. And then that in turn increases your NAD levels and that in turn increases your sirtuin levels and the sirtuins are heavily involved in DNA repair. So I think the number is something like 37 billion chemical reactions happen every second in the human body. And so obviously there's a lot that can go wrong at any given moment. Fortunately, we have a lot of backup systems and repair systems in place, but the problem is as we go on in time, it's particularly in an energy excess state, we don't let those repair systems happen. Repair and recovery in the human body happens in the fasted state and especially happens in the sleeping state. So think about modern American society. Is anybody ever fasted and how much sleep do we get? So we're basically not allowing this repair process to happen. So we've sort of put aging on ourselves if you think about it. 
Okay. So um, we're still talking about the history of aging research. So premature aging was discovered in the 1950s, and this gave some insights into certain proteins that were involved. There's two in particular, the Werner syndrome and the Hutchinson-Gilford syndrome, also called progeria. So in the Werner syndrome, they noticed that these children got cataracts, thin hair, osteoporosis, their skin thinned out, et cetera, and they died very young began in early adolescence or young adulthood. And it was from a single mutation in a single gene that coded for a single protein that relates to repair and maintenance of DNA. So remember I told you we're starting to understand that maybe if we can control the DNA and then the epigenetics of the DNA, maybe we will have less of these problems associated with aging. The connective tissue in Werner syndrome is, is affected dramatically. And I bring that up as an important point, because again, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I see people with connective tissue problems all day long, every day. And a lot of the same reasons that the meniscus tears, that the rotator cuff tears, that they've got neck pain, they got back pain, you know, my arm's stiff, I can't do this, I can't do that. A lot of that is because the connective tissue is failing because of DNA mutations or advanced glycation end products, too much chronic inflammation, too many reactive oxygen species, and it's just not functioning the way it should be. But all of that is fixable, in my opinion. And then Hutchinson Guilford was from a lamin A protein that is a scaf, it codes for a protein that holds the nucleus together. And remember, the nucleus is where the DNA lives. So you essentially you get an unstable nucleus, and then aging happens. So just look quickly on the picture on the left. This is a Japanese American, and the, the far left picture is when she was a teenager, and then to the right is 48 years old. And you can see that the massive advanced aging just from the lack of DNA repair, in particular the connective tissues. And then HBO did a great documentary about a young man with um, progeria, Life According to Sam, if you're interested um, to watch it about sort of the implications of, on a societal level. And then the bottom picture shows you a 30-year-old woman with one of these pro-aging uh, syndromes. So you can see, you can get the same phenotype of somebody that's like in the 70s or 80s much sooner just with some changes in certain proteins. So that makes you think, well, maybe this 80-year-old phenotype is because there's protein changes or DNA changes. Maybe that's not really where we're supposed to be at 80. Maybe that's not supposed to happen until we're 200. We don't know, but we're trying to figure it out. So the 1980s and the 1990s, a particular scientist, Dr. Kenyon at UCSF, which is California, San Francisco, found that a single mutation in one gene for the insulin receptor doubled a worm's life. And then in 1999, the sirtuin number two was discovered in yeast. Yeast is often used as a model because there's certain genes that are shared. So a lot of basic science work starts with yeast, then goes to worms, then goes to mice, and then comes to humans uh, with a monkey step in between sometimes. So overexpression of SIRT2 extends life, and then stress increases the expression of SIRT2. So this is when we started to figure out, remember in 1935, caloric restriction was found to extend life. Now we see that if you have more SIRT2, which is brought on by stress, you live longer. And when I say stress, I mean like low energy stress, things like that, exercise is a stress, high heat like a sauna, cold thermal stress like a uh, cold plunge, those kind of stresses. I'm not talking about, oh, I got my paper due and I didn't start at stress, you know, or gosh, tax, it's tax season kind of stress. I'm just talking about biological stress. That's what you want because it, it will extend your life. Okay, and then in the 2000, uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD+, was discovered as an important molecule as it pertains to sirtuins. So NAD and NADH are shuttle systems. That's how you can probably think of it. They shuttle electrons from the glucose and the Krebs cycle into the electron transport chain where ATP is made. This is a very fundamental molecule of life. It's found in every living organism. It's used all day long, every day. There's billions that you need in your body. Without it, nothing exists. So that is how important NAD is. And guess what happens when we get older? The levels of NAD drop. So one of the keys that have been looked at and is starting to be understood is if you can keep your NAD levels up, then you can extend health span. So NAD is the molecule that links metabolism to the epigenetic silencing because the sirtuins are important in DNA repair, DNA methylation and such, and then longevity. 
And this is the linking vehicle that connects it all. So NAD, we're going to talk about, some people go get IV NAD treatments, um, but we're, it's unclear if there's a true receptor that'll bring NAD out of the blood into the cell. The better way to do it is with molecules that you take orally, like NMN and uh, NR, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but you can increase your levels of this very, very important conserved molecule to life. That is the link between everything you do and eat and then your repair of DNA, repair of proteins, and then energy levels, bioenergetics. Caloric restriction, one of those biologic stressors I said that we should all try to shoot for. 30% fewer calories has been linked to 57% fewer age-related genetic changes. Okay, and now it's thought to be a conserved. And when we say conserved, that means it's in worms, it's in yeast, it's in rats, it's in monkeys, it's in plants, it's in us. It's conserved through all of evolution and every life form on this planet, okay? So caloric restriction induces biologic stress, which increases your levels of sirtuins, drops your mTOR, allows all this cleanup repair stuff to happen. And you will have fewer problems, like fewer episodes of, uh, fewer cases of cognitive decline, better muscle use, better tendon function, less arthritis, which is, of course, what I'm interested in, less musculoskeletal pain, et cetera. Interestingly, I'll just mention this out. There's a gentleman who's very heavily involved in the uh, growing world of circadian science or circadian rhythm science, circadian meaning about a day. So there's more and more knowledge coming out about the importance of following the cycle of the sun because that's how we evolved. So remember I told you about the superchiasmic nucleus and the clock genes that manage the timing of all of our functions and it's based on melatonin and cortisol, which is based on how much light or not, no light there is. And when I say light, I don't mean the dingy fluorescent light in your office, I'm talking about sunlight. Um, Interesting, Dr. Sachin Panda is his name. He brought up a point, I was listening to a podcast one day, he brought up a point that the rats that were caloric restricted in the lab happened to only eat their food during the day in a two hour window. So they were also time restricted, but nobody really knew about that then, certainly didn't write about it and haven't studied it. And now they're starting to do studies looking at well, what if we don't caloric restrict them, we just time restrict them? Or what if we caloric restrict them with an obesogenic diet? What if we caloric restrict them with a very healthy diet, et cetera, et cetera? So all that work's being done right now. So it may not be that you need caloric restriction. It may be more important to time restrict your feeding. And we'll talk about that. So again, 2003, mTOR was found to be important in worms. And mTOR is the target molecule of rapamycin, target of rapamycin, mTOR. So this is why you may have heard that rapamycin extends life. It's because it hits this molecule. Uh, SIR-1 agonist was found in 2003. That's the SIR-2 and number one. And guess what it was? Resveratrol. So resveratrol is considered a longevity molecule. There's a little bit of controversy as to whether resveratrol actually extends life num in numbers, but the quality of life for sure is improved with resveratrol because it's been shown to reduce cognitive decline and to allow better bioenergetics, better cellular cleanup, better DNA cleanup, mitochondrial D uh, cleanup, and it acts as a strong antioxidant. So it reduces high levels of reactive oxygen species that, that you don't want. So that was 2003. 2004, AMPK, which I think is adenosine monophosphate kinase, uh, was found to extend the life in worms. So what is AMPK? This is a molecule that's in your, your body, mitochondrial level, that senses um, when there's too much AMP. So that's adenosine monophosphate. Remember, the gas that runs our car is ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. And in between, there's adenosine diphosphate. So when you put a phosphate molecule onto this adenosine, it, it takes a lot of energy to do that. So that is a high energy bond. So when you break that phosphate off, that's what gives energy. So that's sort of the currency, if you will, in your body for doing anything is ATP. So when you start to get to too much AMP, the cell senses it's in a low energy state and it starts to do what? Clean up, recover, clean house, you know, get rid of dead weight, make sure everything's running properly because this is an evolutionary signal that it is a time of scarcity. And if it's a time of scarcity, you got to do everything perfectly, right? So we, we all know we're about to go into a recession. It's not going to be pretty. So you got to get your house in order. Make sure you know you don't have too much debt. Make sure you don't have too many expenses you don't need. You got to buckle down and bat, you know button down the hatches, if I said that right. And that's what AMPK does for us. And guess what? In 2008, metformin was found to extend the life in mice with that, you know, regular mice, 
and it's because it triggers AMPK. So if you do any reading in the anti-aging or the longevity world, you know that a lot of people are very interested in metformin as a way to extend health span and reduce all-cause mortality and improve. It's even been shown to prevent cancer. So metformin does it through AMPK. Rapamycin does it through mTOR. Resveratrol does it through CERT1. And then 2012, there's sirtuin number six. 2016, we found that the importance of the molecule NAD and NADH because it links every all of this together because it is the, you know, the electron shuttler around from food to these systems. And then also NAD acts to uh, turn on and off certain enzymes that repair DNA and allow you to do that clean house or uh, you know, recovery aspect of cellular health. And then in 2016, they started giving rapamycin and metformin to mice and extended lifespan even further. So this is going on and on, and there's just a ton of work being done here. And we'll update this talk as more things come out. So what is aging? We now know it's not just time. It's not just inevitable. It's probably some type of a disease. It's an accumulation of changes, either from genetic or environmental or food sources. It's an accumulation of DNA damage that is unrepaired of protein misfolds that are not properly folded, of cell membranes that are destroyed and don't function right, but are never repaired. And then some people say it's a loss of information integrity. So that, remember I told you the DNA is pretty constant. What changes is the epigenetic, the modifications, the methylations. So when that starts to go kind of screwy, then the information isn't translated properly. And it's sort of like trying to listen to an eight track right now. You probably can't do it because you don't have the right epigenetic tools to do that. So successful aging is our goal, right? What do we want to do? We want high physical, psychological, and social functioning in our older age, and we don't want major disease, right? Another duh thing. But the duh has yet to be shown how to do it consistently. What? Oh, and senescence, sorry. Yeah, cellular senescence, what is that? So cells tend to divide, right? mitosis, the nucleus replicates itself, the cell breaks off, you get another cell. That's how growth happens. Well, they have a certain number of divisions until it, they stop doing that. And then a cell typically will become what's called senescent. Um, think of these like zombie cells in your body. So if you have a zombie cell, well, you can have a controlled zombie cell that's just sitting there and maybe not doing much to you and it's okay. But most of them start to produce these uh, inflammatory cytokines and inflammatory um, activities and increase the levels of reactive oxygen species around them. And so that zombie creates more zombies, et cetera, et cetera. So the senescent cells are like the walking dead, if you will. And you don't want too many of them. Or if you get a senescent cell, you want to clear it out before it becomes a zombie cell. So that's when you hear the term senolytic. So there's a lot of work being done in that. To how do we clean up these senescent cells? Okay, so what matters? How can we successfully age? And more importantly, how do we feel better today? How do we avoid disease and disability? How do we make sure that we keep our cognition and we have good mental and physical function as we get older and now? How can we be actively engaged in life, right? Like what's the point otherwise? Why wanna live longer if not even engaged? And then how can we be psychologically adapted and have a good social life when we get older? So these are the, dom the domains that probably matter to all of us, right? So just know that we're already on the way. People live longer now than they ever have before. There are more centenarians in the past decades than there have ever been. So it is happening as we speak. Some scientists believe the first person to live to 120 has already been born. I'm hoping that they were talking about me. I'm working hard on it. But I think I caught up to this game a little bit late. But I definitely feel better now. And I'm about to be 49. I feel better now than I did in my 30s, I can tell you for sure. Um, so by 2030, one in six people are going to be over 60. By 2020, there will be more 60-year-olds than five-year-olds, okay? And then the number of 80-year-olds is going to triple to 426 million sometime between 2020 and 2050. So these are the so-called political demographic problems that countries are having. What do you do with all these old people if there's not enough young people? How do we pay for them? How do we keep them in their long care homes and their nursing homes? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. What if these older people were still productive and happy and healthy and felt good and worked? I mean, that's the dream, right? Uh, who wants to be in a nursing home when they're 90? You don't. What if you said, I'm going to make sure that you're still working when you're 90? It may sound bad now, but it may, that may be the way of life, a normal thing later. 
So why do some people live longer? And we, you've heard of the blue zones. If you watch my Mediterranean talk or any of the talks about nutrition, you may have heard of this. There are certain areas in the world where there are more centenarians than anywhere else. Loma Linda, California, and that's uh, most likely due to the Seventh-day Adventists, the religious order there, and they fast periodically, and then when they do eat, they eat very healthy, um, <clears throat> and they have a very good spiritual life, so they've handled the psychological aspect of aging well. Sardinia, which is in Italy, Loma, uh, we talked about Loma Linda, Okinawa, Japan, okay, the Okinawa diet, or pescatarian kind of a diet, Nicoya, and then Icaria, so all of these areas and then, of course, you hear me talk about the Mediterranean diet in the seven country study. All of these areas have people that are already living better and longer than us. And the question is why? And we're starting to figure out why. So there are nine features of the long lived people in the so called blue zone. And of course, that's been copyrighted because it's a book written by some scientists. <clears throat> and I think it was blue zone just because they were using a blue marker at the time to mark out these areas. Um, but don't quote me on that. So nine features, movement, purpose, stress management, diet, 80% rule, wine at five, hanging with the right group of people or the right tribe, loved ones take priority, so family and friends first, and then belonging, like having a sense of purpose. So knowing your sense of purpose or having a sense of purpose is worth about seven extra years of good life. Think about that. So there's a lot of people that are, have learned helplessness in our society, a lot of people that are depressed and miserable, and they just feel like they're not here for any reason. And those are the ones that are not going to make it. They're not going to live to 120 or 110. You have to have a sense of purpose. You have to have a calling, so to speak. So the 80% rule is interesting. Um, stop eating when you're 80% full. Don't go all the way to where your stomach hurts from being so fed fully. Stop before you think you're full and you will be full. So remember, all of this requires sensation and satiety hormones to be produced and make it to the brain. And then the brain has to process that information. So if you stop at 80%, you probably ate enough, 20% caloric restricted, right? Um, but it's enough and you'll be full, just give it a little bit of time. So that's another trick and that's an actionable tool today. So you get a huge plate of food when you go to Olive Garden or whatever. I mean, these restaurants serve more food than anyone should ever eat. Stop, I mean, I would stop at a quarter of that plate, of course, but you at least stop at 80% and you're doing yourself a huge favor. That's something actionable now. Try to find a sense of purpose. That is actionable now. Drink moderately if you're going to drink. Now, a lot of people aren't going to drink for a variety of reasons, which is fine. If you do drink alcohol, it has to be in moderation, okay? And then it should be socially. So you should not be drinking beer by yourself. Um, it's, it should be social because the socializing, that psychological aspect of life makes your life better now. And, and also guess what? Healthy aging. And then belonging to a faith-based community adds four to 14 years to life. I mean, that's amazing if you think about it. So if you're one of the people out there going to church now and volunteering and involved in, in church life, whatever type of church that might be, kudos to you because you're adding seven to 14 years to your life because you've given yourself a sense of purpose and you've given yourself a faith-based community. So just sort of, I think of it like getting out of your own head, like knowing there's something bigger than you, things matter more than you. We're just little specks of dust, right? Um, not being so wrapped up in yourself. And guess what? That makes your life longer and better now. And then family first. So here's a key. One of the problems in America is we don't take care of our extended family, right? Go to other societies and the great grandchildren are in the same house with the great grandparents. Everybody lives together. They all kind of take care of each other and it's sort of just the way it is. Um, and it's a given not in our society. We don't take care of our own. And that's why we have a lot of our healthcare problems, I think, one of the reasons. So family first, staying with a life partner, you know, whatever that might be, adds three years. So basically just not breaking up a family. Don't break up your family unit. You know, have a good cohesive family unit and ideally include the older members and the younger members all together. And that not only does does it give you sort of that backstop of you've got a team, right? You've got a support system, but you now have another sense of purpose. So all of this matters. And then hang out with other healthy people. So look, I like to eat healthy. I'm trying to get my circadian rhythm locked down. I love working. I love being a surgeon. I love all my patients. Um, but if I hung out with a bunch of people that smoked cigarettes all day and stayed up all night and never ate anything remotely on the Mediterranean diet list, 
I probably wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. So it's important to surround yourself by other healthy people, other people with a sense of purpose, and you know, make sure that you, you have a good like peer group if you wanna be healthy and have optimal aging. So that is important. One of the best ways to change your diet is to get the whole family to change your diet. Usually it doesn't happen otherwise. I run into this in clinic all the time. I have patients that wanna quit smoking, but everyone in their house smokes. I have patients that wanna stop drinking sugary drinks, but everybody likes the red Cokes. I got patients that wanna to try to eat healthy, but everybody wants their Jiffy peanut butter bunny bread sandwich. I mean, it's, just, it's an uphill battle and not unless you're in the right group that's gonna help you be healthy. So again, all of this is actionable today and will add years to your life, better years. Life expectancy we already talked about, 78.2 right now. It dropped with um, drug overdoses a few years ago. It's gonna drop again because we've got more fentanyl overdoses now than ever. Um, and then COVID was also an anomalous year, but in general, 78.2, that's a good long life, right? But I think of 70 as middle age, personally. I have a bunch of 70-year-old patients, 80-year-old patients that are very active, out there playing pickleball, cognitively sharp as tax, just great people volunteering, doing everything they can, writing books. So it's possible. 70,000 Americans made it to their 100th birthday this year, okay? And you might think, oh, that's because they got good genes, they're lucky. Not so. They've done studies on this, and I'll tell you about one, a Danish twin study. So look, looking at monozygotic identical twins, only about 20% of their longevity could be attributed to the genetic, the genes, the basic DNA, right? Epigenetics and lifestyle make up the other 80%. So you are in control of your own longevity. Don't blame your genes and don't count on your genes. You have to do it yourself. Drink some water. Okay, there is a genetic theory of aging, speaking of. And this theory is that the genetic activity is solely responsible for aging and should be the only target for treatment, parentheses, big pharma, in parentheses. Longevity genes regulate the oxidative stress response, so you can only alter your response to oxidative stress by changing your longevity genes. And of course, those relate to biological aging. I don't personally subscribe to this. I think some genes are massively important and should be accounted for, and there's a lot of great work being done. There's too much that is self-empowering for us. You can reduce your own reactive ox oxygen species loads, and we've talked about how to do that with antioxidants and a proper diet, exercise, and good sleep. You can reduce your own inflammation levels, and guess what? That changes how much DNA is mutated and damaged, how many proteins are folded pro improperly, how your cell membranes do work. Um, so there's a lot you can do yourself. So I think genes are massively important, don't get me wrong, but it's certainly not the only thing that's gonna keep you living longer and better. So the short list of genes and, and or their products are AMPK, sirtuins, IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor, tightly linked to growth hormone levels. The CLOC-1 gene, we talked about that. This is what regulates the timing of cellular functions. P66, catalase, which is an antioxidant, and clotho, which I think is another CLOC gene. More and more of these are being found on a daily basis, but at the end of the day, you still have to eat right, sleep well, manage your mental stress, have a sense of purpose, be active, et cetera. And that's what really matters. So example of sirtuins. So these are found throughout and they deacetylase. So, so they'll like put acetyl groups on, take them off, put methyl groups on, take them off, et cetera. So they kind of do a cleanup and repair function for DNA and then mitochondrial DNA. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. And remember, what we don't want to end up with with a programmed cell death is a senescent zombie cell. So you want to have a way to clean that up. You want to have a way to manage your inflammation, your DNA damage and repair. And you want to regulate the cell cycles, which comes back to circadian rhythms. You want to be able to resist stress or have a good stress resistance. So there's a lot of work being done on people that spend time in cold plunge pools are have better stress management skills later because their body has figured out a way to manage a shock, a stressful system. So later when they're in an exam setting or you know they got a project due or there's a car accident or something horrible, the brain and their body is better able to ha handle it because they've been trained by just exposing themselves to cold water or alternatively going in the sauna 20 minutes a day, okay? Because you induce heat shock proteins. And again, you stress with thermal changes and your brain is able to handle future stress. Stress resistance is very important for long functional life. Mitochondrial function, I've talked about the mitochondria ad nauseum. Without good mitochondria, we are nothing. 
hugely important. The sirtuins, one through seven, we talked about IGF. There's certain other genes, the forkhead box genes, very important to long life, optimal aging. I can go on and on. All of these are important, but don't hang, don't get hung up on them because you can still modify the function of all of these with your life and doing some certain things now. So again, your advanced glycation end products. So this is one thing that you really can kind of modify right now to make your joints feel better, to make your bones work better, your tendons and ligaments, to have your muscles stronger and to reduce um, thick and um, not functioning our arteries and veins uh, because this is where these monster proteins deposit on all of those structures. So basically you wanna avoid forming them. So you gotta maintain a good blood glucose. There's an Israeli study that says 87 is really the highest it should be. Now, of course, the normal in America is like 95 to 100, but really we should shoot for lower than that um, so that we don't have an excess of glucose running around because that causes a whole host of problems to include the formation of advanced glycation end products. And then you don't wanna eat them. Where do you find them? Processed meat, anything cooked in high heat in a dry environment and processed foods. So Americans eat a ton of advanced glycation end products on the standard American diet. Now, hopefully a lot of you are now on the Mediterranean diet or something like that. Um, but basically this is why processed meat is so bad for you. Not only are you forming heterocyclic amines and cancer causing molecules, but you're also forming a bunch of the advanced glycation end products in that processed meat. Then you eat it and they have proven that it transfers from the intestines into your body. So avoiding dietary ages and then avoiding the formation of them by keeping your blood glucose good is another way you can feel a lot better. And this is why one of the reasons diet is so important. Good. Is that a question? We have a question. Does this include the air fryer? I think so, yes. So I stopped using the air fryer a long time ago um, because that by definition is high dry heat and I think it forms more advanced glycation end products in food. Boil anything with water or if you marinate food before you cook it like meat, an acidic environment forms less of these. Slow, low heat and a lot of um, fluid or humidity or water helps reduce the formation of these as well. Barbecue? What? We have another question, is barbecue okay? No, in, a, in short, because not only are you getting the carcinogens from the smoke, but it, that too is high dry heat. So I know I'm going to, probably people are monitoring because I'm saying no barbecue and no air fryers, but just think about it. Once you start to think about it and if foods that aren't cooked that way, I, you're going to feel better. And that's what we all want, right? We want to feel better to sharpness. We don't want to be glommed up with all of these little monsters running around us. So dietary ages, here's your grill picture. Probably one of the worst things you can do, processed red meat on a grill. I probably would not eat that. Um, if you are gonna eat it, once a month at the most, I would suggest, and then take a lot of antioxidant, clean it up. Um, diabetes increases the formation of age. So some people call diabetes accelerated aging syndrome, okay? So I have a lot of diabetic patients with a lot of connective tissue problems, thick, tight Achilles tendons, wounds that don't heal, damaged joints, more arthritis, achy, creaky. And it's because they form these advanced glycation products at a much higher rate than you or I, if you don't have diabetes. And so all of their tissues are thicker. They're not elastic. There's too many abnormal crosslinks between the fibers of the collagen in a tendon. So tendon's supposed to be like a nice, smooth braided rope. Well, when you get these aberrations and alterations, those braids don't move properly. And that's when you get stiff and achy and you just can't, you know, you can't reach behind your shoulder blades and you can't put your bra on this way, things like that. All of that is advanced glycation end products. They just happen more in diabetics. Why? Because there's more sugar around. Next. So what are ages and aging have to do with each other? We just talked about it. Not only it stiffens tissues, we know that, right? Because you get these abnormal depositions of these monster proteins in your collagen or your connective tissue, but they also induce the formation of more free radicals. There's actually a receptor, the RAGE receptor for advanced glycation end product. When these, when they glom onto that receptor, it induces, a, just spews forth damaging cytokines and proteins and inflammation. Um, and so, not only are you gonna have abnormal collagen with abnormal crosslinks and stiffer tissue, but you're inducing damage all around. 
by having too many of these monster proteins. So this is something actionable that we can control now, right? We can reduce the levels of these in our body just by sort of changing what we eat and maintaining our blood glucose. We have, a, we have another question. Yeah, so the question is roasted vegetables on high heat. So I think ages will form, but it's not gonna be as many as with animal protein. So these really form mostly in animal proteins, okay? Um, and it's still better to eat a vegetable than to not eat a vegetable. So if you roast with a high polyphenol olive oil on high heat for like, what, 20 minutes or so, that's probably fine. Um, it's still gonna be better for you than bacon, for sure. Um, so think of this more like high dry heat processed foods like potato chips, Cheetos, formula, believe it or not. A lot of baby formula is made this way powdered milk, things like that, and then um, ham, bacon, burgers, anything fast food, obviously, is going to have a ton of these. Um, so probably one of the best things you can do for yourself if you haven't already done it, because probably if you're watching this webinar, you're in tune with your own health. Um, so sort of a self-selected po population, right? Just stop going to fast food restaurants, period, full stop. And that, by definition, is going to probably add a few years to your life and make you feel a lot better because you're not going to get these. The other thing about fast food restaurants that nobody talks about, and I would love to find a way to study this, is they reuse the same vat of oil, especially now because of inflation, over and over and over and over and over and over again. Well, every time you fire that up, and they're using cheap oil. They're not using extra virgin olive oil with um, you know, extra polyphenols like I buy. They're using the cheapest oil they can find, and then they reuse it, and they keep oxidizing it with the heat. So there's going to be even more ages. So roasted vegetables, I would eat that all day long before I'd go to Cane's or something like that. So next slide. That brings me to another point. All of this information I'm giving you, it, the whole point is just to teach, right? But any little thing you do is going to be better than not doing it. So if you want to eat a roasted vegetable and you aren't going to eat a vegetable otherwise, roast that vegetable, please. Because you need the polyphenols and the dietary fiber, the flavonoids and the other things in that vegetable. Okay? So the advanced glide just pulled this up, a random slide um, kind of made up. But there's a lot of companies coming out with different things to test for these. There's not a great test for it. I've been looking at a, a way to test it on the skin of the forearm from a Danish company. It's really the only one I could find. Um, but it's extremely expensive. And of course, the American healthcare system doesn't care about this, so it's not going to be covered looking for this. Um, but just to show you, I think probably most of the work in this is going to be done in the cosmetics facial rejuvenation field because that's where you see it the most, wrinkles and damaged collagen in your face. So next. All right, so this just shows you the process of the formation. We'll just quickly run through this. You got glucose and protein, which then forms something called a shift base, and it's still kind of reversible at this stage. Then it goes to what's called an amidori product, which is just another reaction. So it's a kind of a three-step reaction. And then you get the permanent irreversible advanced glycation product, and that is showing you how it cross-links two molecules of a collagen. So it gloms onto one and then cross-links to the other, and then those collagen molecules can't move. That's why you get stiff and achy and don't feel so good and your cartilage can't heal itself. So it's kind of like a molecular clock because it loves long-lived fibers. So it's going to go to the longest-lived collagen. So because if you have a low turnover product in your body like the Achilles tendon or your lens in your eye, any level of glucose in your blood is going to have more time to form these products. And so that's why we get cataracts, okay? Eye lenses form these. That's why we get Achilles tendon ruptures in midlife, somewhere between 40 and 60. That's why everybody's rotator cuff tears. And I, I mean like everybody is very high levels in asymptomatics at a certain age. It's because over time, these deposit create irregular connective tissues that don't work right or are dysfunctional, more prone to tearing and cannot repair themselves et cetera, et cetera. Next. Hold on. Okay. So age accumulation, I think, is another key to aging that we do have the power to control. And you're still going to eat some of these. You're still going to form some of them. But you can kind of control them a lot. So another way they form is exogenous toxins, right, like pollution and whatnot, which also induces reactive oxygen species. But basically, being in an excess energy state or weighing too much, not exercising to try to clear them out of the tendons, and then uh, different 
factors that go into how many processed foods you eat, and that could be environmental, geography, socioeconomic, just, you know, what do you know about processed foods, things like that. So you could control a lot of this and then help your body to clear it out and clear it up by giving it the right tools. So give your body antioxidants, give your body anti-inflammatories that are natural. Don't feed your body bacon too many times, okay? Things like that. And we can control the level of ages. So what can I do, you do right now to increase my longevity and make me feel better today? So the first thing, it doesn't sound very fun, but it works really well, and it's been proven in massive amounts of studies, is eat less often and eat better when you do eat. You have to exercise. You need to socialize. You should probably supplement. I do. I'm not going to preach supplementation, but I cannot get 10 servings of fruits and vegetables in my body every day like I'm supposed to. Um, just because of timing and whatnot, and you know, when you're busy. Now, I have started time restricted eating because it is so healthy for you, I'm not doing it for weight loss, but just doing time restricted feeding makes it hard to eat enough. You, like, you, it's hard to overeat because you just don't have time to. Um, and then, you know, the, the antioxidants and the supplements will increase things like your omega 6 ratio or omega 3 index, sorry. So I take a lot of extra omega 3s because that's been shown to increase life increase lifespan and health span and also to help your tendons and ligaments and tissues work and move better. So I'm, um, and it's also been shown to help mood and stabilize just general stress resistance uh, because it helps build the cells in the brain and all the nervous system. So I'm a huge fan of omega-3. So there's a lot of reasons to supplement. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then sleep. I can't emphasize sleep enough. Probably if you do anything after this talk, get your sleep in order. That's gonna be the number one way to optimize life and feel better because that's when all your repair functions happen. So let's say you went for a run, you damaged your cartilage in your knee. The only way your body's gonna fix that is if you're in a low energy state and, and sleeping. That's when it happens. It doesn't happen during the day when you're at work. So you gotta give your body a chance to heal itself. And as anybody that knows me knows, I'm a big fan of empowering the body to do what it does best, which is heal. And then optimize stress. We have a question. So I got a question, what brand of olive oil do I use? My producer happened to put it in front of me, which I guess I'll reach over and get it. I've been doing a lot of research in olive oil and I can't tell you for sure this is gonna be the end all and be all, but I did some research to find high polyphenol content, extra virgin olive oil, which means it's got a lot more of the natural antioxidants in it. And I can tell you that olive oil is extremely delicious, but you want the high polyphenol content because when you cook with it and when you heat it up, uh, all oils will self-oxidize. And the last thing you want to do is oxidate yourself, right? But the polyphenols negate that. So the higher it begins, like the higher the number of polyphenols, the better off you will be. The higher the oleic acid content, the better off you will be. And olive oil is a monounsaturated fat, omega-9 massively anti-inflammatory and good for you. We should all have a few tablespoons of that kind of olive oil every day. So there's also another one, Bragg's um, organic, all natural olive oil I've looked at, but I will tell you a future talk might just be on olive oil because I've been doing a lot of research. Um, it's very fascinating world and it's really hard to find really good olive oils. Definitely don't ever get it in a clear bottle and definitely only ever get extra virgin olive oil. UV light, oxidizes the oil. So that's why you want it in a dark bottle, okay? What? Oh yeah, no, I'm not affiliated with this at all. I did some research. I joined Olive Oil Times and I started reading their thing. And then I just did some Google searching and found this group. This is out of Greece, Ancient Foods. I have no idea who makes this, but it's it was the highest polyphenol content I could find that I could get to America. Okay, eating less often. So I'm gonna say this, and people are probably gonna get angry at me, especially all of the trident, you know, all the people that learned, well, we didn't learn nutrition in medical school, but you know, that school should never be hungry and you should eat multiple meals during the day. It's actually okay to be hungry, just so you know. 
If you're hungry, that means your system was stressed out enough to get hungry, which means, guess what? Your AMPK levels have gone up, your sirtuin levels have gone up, your mTOR has gone down, you don't have too much glucose running around the system, your insulin sensitivity has gone up, and all of your stress response systems have been engaged. You're cleaning up old DNA, you're fixing mutations, you're repairing cell membranes, your receptors are working better, and you're folding improperly folded proteins. So it is okay to be hungry. I'm not advocating starvation here, I'm not advocating anything like that. That. I just want you to know it's okay to be hungry. So time-restricted feeding will help with this, okay? This is the most effective method to enhance the cellular repair systems in your body. So again, I told you I started doing this just for this purpose, just to be healthier and optimize my aging. So you can time-restrict your feeding, and that gives your body enough time to be fasted, okay? If you're eating up until midnight and you're not getting a good sleep, like let's say you don't sleep well and you're watching TV and you're having snacks at midnight and then you have to wake up at six to go to work and you start with like some kind of sugary breakfast. Well, that means you only had about five hours, but guess what? It takes about five hours for food to pass through the gut to even get to the fasted state. So you never are fasted if that's kind of the way you, you go about your business. So you got to restrict it where you have enough time, enough of a window to allow these repair things to happen. So that can range from a 12-12 schedule to a 10-14 to a 16-8. Um, probably we're going to have to do a whole talk on time-restricted eating because it's just such a big topic. Um, but basically, once you start doing this and your liver gets used to it and your liver starts to do what's called gluconeogenesis on demand when you have lower blood sugar, you get a steady state where your blood sugar stays the same and you never really have spikes. And then ideally, it's 87 or less like we talked about. We have a question. Uh, the question is how much is too much in terms of supplements? I think I got that right. Like, can you take too many supplements? Um, I probably take a double handful in the morning and then a single handful at night. Um, but they're all different kinds. So omega-3, D3, minerals. We always forget about minerals, magnesium, things like that. Massively important, calcium. Um, tart cherry extract, turmeric, uh, resveratrol, NMN, which is a precursor to NAD. Uh, quercetin, D3, another one that you really should be on if you're not. Um, so I think unless you're eating a perfect diet grown in perfect soil uh, with grains that have not been modified to the point where they're not, you know, useful plants anymore, um, probably you need to supplement a lot. It's really hard to over supplement. Um, don't quote me on that and don't get mad about that. There are certain times where you take too much and you're going to have side effects, of course. And of course, always check with your treating physician. Um, we're not here to dispense medical advice. We're just here to educate. Um, but, it, you know, it's hard to take too much D3. It's hard to take too much omega-3. It's hard to take too much tart cherry. Um, you know, if you can eat 10 servings of perfect fruits and vegetables every day, maybe you don't need a supplement. If you can get wild-caught fish and eat it two to three times a week, maybe you don't need a supplement with omega-3. You know, if you can get out in sunlight 30 minutes a day and you're doing a perfect set of zone two exercise and um, muscle, uh, you know, resistance work twice a week, then maybe you don't need a supplement. I need to because I can't do everything perfectly. I'm doing what I can. But, you know, you, this is one of those questions you got to talk to whoever's managing all of your meds because, of course, you want to make sure nothing interacts with whatever prescription med you're on, et cetera, et cetera. So I take a ton and uh, been doing it for a couple of years now and haven't had any issues. I feel better than ever, um, but everybody's different. Look at the bottom right picture here. That shows you a tendon or collagen bundle with advanced glycation end products in it. And the one on the right shows you what it should look like normally. So this just shows you what I'm talking about. This is the browning reaction. So I didn't mention that before when we were talking about ages. But advanced glycation end products, that is the same reaction that causes, when you sear a steak, when you saute something and it gets that sort of brown color and it starts to smell really good and it changes the flavor, that is the Maillard reaction which was discovered in the cooking world, in the chemistry world for cooking science, <clears throat> the same thing is happening in your body. You're browning your collagen, all of your proteins, with advanced glycation end products. So unless you want to be a seared steak inside, you probably need to control this stuff. So eat better. So remember I said it's okay to time restrict your feeding and kind of get on a better schedule. When you do eat, eat better. Extra virgin olive oil, omega-3 heavy foods, a plant-based diet is ideal. Mediterranean diet is my favorite. Um, 
you know, high fiber, so dietary fiber. So the Mediterranean diet, it does not say don't eat carbs. Carbs are good. You just want good carbs. You want complex carbs that take a while to pass through the gut and have polysaccharides that enhance certain um, gut microbiota function, which then in turn produce different neurotransmitters and different proteins for better health. So, um, and then you want to combine certain foods. So if you're going to eat something with high carbohydrates and you mix it with a fat, like an extra virgin olive oil, it'll slow down the absorption and you don't get the big glucose spikes. So what you eat, the combinations of what you eat, how you eat and the timing of eating, all this matters. And all of it can make you feel amazing today, whereas you don't feel amazing today. So you just, and, and you can start with simple things. Like first, just try to time restrict. Don't bother changing what you're eating. And then slowly change what you eat. Then change how you cook it. Then change the combinations. It's too, it's just too much to do all at once. I'm still adding pieces and parts to a better life. So the Okinawa longevity diet is another one. There's a whole bunch out there. I love the Mediterranean diet because it's doable. It's delicious. It emphasizes socializing, alcohol in moderation, particularly red wine, which has resveratrol. Although you'd have to drink 150 bottles of red wine to get the same amount of resveratrol as you probably should be taking for longevity. Um, so don't do that. And just know that the Okinawa longevity diet here and the Mediterranean probably too, is at about 1% added sugar. Our government says it's okay to add 6%. Previously, our government said it's okay to add 21%. They got beat up by the wellness industry, pushed back by the food industry. They were at 10% recently and just now dropped it to 6%. Remember, this is the same group that said high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated oils and trans fats were good for us. So I would go with the people that live longer, not with just what's regulated. So the Okinawa type diet, the Mediterranean diet, don't add sugar to anything if you can help it. And exercise, shown to reduce, well, it increases mTOR when you're building muscle, but then it shuts it down quickly, increases sirtuin activity, increases AMPK activity, pulls glucose out of the blood, okay, increases the stroke volume, gets more blood to the brain, Exercise has a variety of mechanisms whereby it makes you feel better and enhances longevity. And you don't have to go join a cross gym or look like this, this guy on the top left. But look at this lady over here deadlifting. You think she ever has back pain? Probably not. And look at this guy down there with the tattoos and the beard. I mean, he's in his 70s, 80s, and just killing it at the gym. This is all possible. You don't have to feel like it's impossible. You just got to make some basic changes. 30 to 45 minutes a day, daily zone two. Zone two is when you can kind of talk to someone, but it's a little bit hard. You know, you're, you're elevating your heart rate a little bit. So like a brisk walk or like a really slow jog or on the treadmill or elliptical or aqua size, just 30 minutes a day. That's all you have to do five days a week if you can't do seven. And then a little bit of weight training. One of the number one reasons people feel bad when they get older is because they get weak. Uh, and why do we get weak? Well, all the reasons we talked about, plus reductions in NAD levels. But because we stop doing stuff that keeps your muscles strong. So most of us will have to go to the gym and or just do some push-ups or planks, something, yoga, whatever you can do to just increase resistance so that you, you induce muscle protein synthesis and you don't lose muscle. Oh. So for instance, me personally, I, you know, I started this health quest a while back um, and add pieces as I can because I'm pretty busy and it's hard. But one of the things I wanted to add in was ex I wasn't exercising for a while because I just felt like I didn't have time. But then I finally got fed up. There's just too much data to support the benefits of exercise. So now I wake up super early, like five, whatever, and I try to get out there and walk in the neighborhood. So I walk for about 30 to 40 minutes a day. I listen to a podcast, so it's productive time for me too. And guess what? I'm also out when the sun rises. So I get 30 to 40 minutes of low angle sunlight, <clears throat> which, in, which hits my melanopsin cells in my retina, which shuts off melatonin and induces all of the changes of the circadian rhythm that allow you to have a beneficial good day. So all of this is important. Um, and since I started doing that, I have more energy. I feel better. I'm happier. Um, and I'm, I think I'm able to manage stress a bit better. So all of these pieces just will build on themselves for you too. And you know what? I didn't start walking five days a week. I just, and I didn't start at 30 minutes. So just do what you can, but it, movement is better than no movement. Just like eating the roasted vegetable is better than not eating the vegetable. So uh, take all of this with a grain of salt and just take the pieces you can do and start doing them. And guess what? You're going to want to do the next thing and you're going to want to learn about the next thing. It'll grow on itself. It's like a snowball. All right. Next slide.
All right. So the probably we should do a whole talk on exercise. Evidence is just, there's too much evidence to ignore it. You have to exercise. It's been shown to be one of the only reasons that people don't have back pain, the ones that don't. Uh, it's certainly been shown to reduce cognitive decline and reduce cases of uh, dementia, things like that. It's certainly been shown to make your life longer and better. Um, so exercise is so important. I, you just, it's, an, it's mandatory. You can't get around it. You've got to find a way to move. Um, and if you can't move, like let's say there's some physical reason that you can't exercise at all, then try to find a way to get in the sauna. Um, if you sit in a sauna for 20 minutes a day, assuming you get cleared by your doctor to do so, you can replicate or mimic a lot of the effects of moderate zone two exercise in terms of stroke volume, sweat, et cetera. So you got to do, you got to move primarily. That's the number one rule for good life now and later. So also, if you saw my talk on knee pain last time, the people with arthritis that exercise have less pain, even with the same level of disease, than the people with arthritis that don't exercise. So your doctors may tell you, oh, you have arthritis, you just can't run or you can't do this anymore, you can't do that. I wouldn't listen to them. I would get out there, go find a good physical therapist or chiropractor or work with you, a personal trainer, and find a way to exercise because you will feel better and have less pain. Uh, <clears throat> this goes without saying, but if you're a smoker, quit. That's probably the worst thing you can do for any aspect of your health, especially the lifespan. And then eating correctly, we talked about. And when I said move, just move if you can move. So even just fidgeting, like just tapping your knee has reduced all-cause mortality by 30%. So you have to move. Your body has to sense that need for energy to get you into that stress response state. So there really is no alternative. You've got to figure out a way to incorporate some type of activity into your life. And like I said, it may be difficult for a lot of people out there, but you, you got to work with your people, your team, and figure it out. Oh, for the sauna comment I made, that all those studies have been done in the Finnish type sauna, the, the high humidity steam type sauna where it gets to about 180 degrees or so. Uh, more data is coming out on infrared spas. Like I have one in my clinic and I just let people sit in it if they want and I sit in it when I can. That only gets to about 160, I think. However, the infrared light waves heat you up internally. So your core probably gets to the same level as it would in a, in a Finnish sauna, but they the studies just aren't out there yet on the infrared, but they're coming. They've been working on a lot of um, studies using sauna type heat to treat depression, believe it or not. It works better than most drugs and the effects last six weeks. So, um, you know, everything in your body is connected. And if you can correct some cellular function somewhere, it often makes things better elsewhere. So again, Endurance and exercise, so you get more mitochondria and more healthy mitochondria in your cell, which does what? Gives you more energy, allows more reduction of glucose out of the blood, and um, sort of lets you function better, if you will. You get increased capillary density, which means the blood volume to any given muscle, and guess where else? Your brain and your heart improves. Increased stroke volume in your heart, you get um, your heart rate becomes better handle, better able to handle changes. So you get more heart rate variability, which is actually good. Um, and increase what's called mitophagy or autophagy. This is that cleanup repair system. So over time, your mitochondria degenerate and fall apart just like your car engine does, right? You gotta get it maintained. Um, and so mitophagy is that process where the body senses a damaged mitochondria that's not working right. And it will either chew it up and recycle the parts or repair it and combine it with a healthier mitochondria um, and make it a better one, or it'll just repair it and it'll divide and be two new good mitochondria. So there's different ways your body handles it, but all of it needs to be, it, it, most of it happens in sleep and or in the fasted state, we think. So a single session of good exercise changes the expression of about 9,800 molecular analytes or different little proteins. Think about that. It is a poly pill. It's like the best drug out there is exercise. It's better than anything that you can take or do. And it's free, which is probably why no one talks about it. Um, but you got to figure out a way to move. My number one advice. Second is try to eat healthy, ideally Mediterranean. Third is sleep, 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 sleep. You got to get a good sleep schedule. And ideally, hopefully you're not a shift worker. If you are, that's a whole nother topic. But really, we should be like we were back when we were cavemen and following the sun. Like everyone needs to get a good circadian routine. Next slide. 
No, next one. Oh, resistance, sorry. Okay, so resistance exercise. So the endurance was the zone two cardio. We talked about 30 minutes a day, four to seven days a week. Um, resistance is muscle, lifting weights. You have to do it. And I've got plenty of 70 and 80 year old ladies that go to the gym and do lift weights. It can be done and it should be done. Um, reducing sarcopenia, which is a natural 1% loss of muscle mass. It starts, I think, in your 30s or 40s every year. Reduces frailty. So you know, the people that have trouble going up the stairs when they get older or getting out of a chair, they can't just pop out of a chair like this. They have to like inch forward, fold over and use their arms. That's a sign of quadriceps weakness and frailty in addition to other things, of course. So you don't want that, right? So the way to prevent that is to keep the muscle you have now. So figure out a way to at least twice a week work on your major mo muscle groups, okay? And the best exercises are the ones that incorporate a full range of motion and multiple muscles. So you could talk to your physical therapist or your personal trainer or your chiropractor, probably not your doctor because a lot of doctors don't talk about exercise. But if you see me, we can talk about it. And then, of course, it activates mTOR in the muscle. Now, remember, we don't want too much mTOR activity because that is associated with shorter life. But you do want to build protein periodically and have protein synthesis. So you do need to have it then. And then it inhibits it in the liver. So <clears throat> exercise makes the liver function better, builds your muscle pulls glucose out of the serum and does all those other things we talked about. So it's pretty awesome and it's, and it's free. Debbie Gleason just recommended a book. She's 63. She said it's six minutes, six minute fitness at 60. She said it helped her out a lot. So maybe y'all can go buy that book um, and just get moving. So next slide. All right. So exercise and appropriate body weight. So remember we talked about that. So you, if you want to live long and feel great now, if you want to feel great now and later, you cannot have an excess energy state. So you have to be a good body weight or less, right? Um, and then you want to have the appropriate exercises to add to the muscle mass where you don't, you, no one's trying to be Arnold Schwarzenegger here. You just don't want to keep losing muscle. You want to maintain like, like probably where I am today is what I want to maintain and have when I'm 120, if I get lucky. Um, which means not only do I need to do the walking I started doing, but at some point I'm going to have to add weightlifting back in. Now, my job happens to be pretty physical, so I'm lucky in that way, and I use my muscles all the time. Um, but down the road, I will have to add that piece too somehow. I have to find the time. Um, and then we're going to talk about a few exercises that are good to kind of like keep the big groups of muscles that you really need for function, right? Because there's certain things you want to be able to do. You want to be able to sit on the floor with your grandkids and play and get up successfully, right? Basic function that a lot of people lack because they don't think about this ahead of time and work on it. So the lateral band walk, the trap bar deadlift, the neutral grip dumbbell press, the suspension trainer row, the kettlebell swing, and the farmer's walk. These are basic exercises that, that will provide that functional fitness and lack of frailty that you want as you extend your lifespan. So this kind of shows you those different exercises. <clears throat> so that's the farmer's walk on the left. You can do that with kettleballs too. The lateral band walk, the middle picture with the lady with the band on her side. So you just kind of go side to side with these TheraBand type things. So it works your hip muscles and your side muscles and agility. The TRX or the suspension row there, it's almost like a payoff pool. So if you just have access to a cable-based trainer, or even you could wrap a TheraBand around a fixed object and just pull, right? So that's a great exercise. The deadlift, done properly, okay? So you need to have um, somebody show you how to do that and do it properly. And if you notice, she's wearing a weight belt. Weight belts are good in one way. If they're on loosely enough that the only way it stays on you is if you clench your core, right? So you have to engage your core before you do these types of exercises. And having that weight belt on gives you that tactile sensation that helps you engage your core before you do this. So you're working your core and your back muscles. Um, if you're wearing a weight belt too tight, and it'll just end up making you weak and get injured. So that's a caveat there. And then of course, you got the dumbbell bench press there. And then this lady on the right is doing a kettlebell swing on the bottom right. So all of these, you can think about the different things in life that you have to do, you know, carrying groceries from the car to your house, you know, um, pulling open a heavy door, 
walking in an uneven surface, picking up your grandkid from the ground. All of this induces functional muscle gains that you don't want to lose. You probably have all this now, um, but it's going away at 1% a year at least. So you need to start thinking about this stuff now. And you don't have to join a gym for any of this. You can A lot of this you can just do at home with like stuff around the house. So exercise, hugely important. Sleep. This is the most important thing that I want to impart to you. Probably the most important. I think it is. Seven to eight hours, seven to nine really, for adults, ideally uninterrupted. Nobody should be sleeping three to four hours a night. Shift work is terrible, but something like 20% of the country is a shift worker, which is unfortunate. Uh, the way our society is now is a 24-hour society, so we have to have shift workers, which is terrible because it's bad for them. Um, so without sleep, all the waste proteins that happen during the day just accumulate along with adenosine. Now, adenosine is what gives you quote unquote sleep pressure. This is what builds up during the day. You sleep, it gets cleared out. Your body says, okay, I have no more adenosine. It's time to wake up. It builds up during the day. You sleep, it clears out. Coffee works by inhibiting the adenosine receptor. So it, um, kind of diminishes that sleep pressure that happens in your brain, even with the same amount of adenosine. That's why being caffeinated sort of makes us feel like we're awake and keeps us from sleeping. Um, <clears throat> but basically, you need to clear out this protein, and that's just one protein. M massive numbers of bad proteins build up during the day. And in fact, amyloid plaques, which is what we see in the brains of Alzheimer's, people that sleep better and have more regular sleep have fewer formations of these things, and they've shown that over time. And then this picture of this brain shows you the diminished functional connectivity between the cognitive control or like your motor skills, vision and other brain regions after 24 hours of sleep deprivation. So you can see all of the brain activity on the top left, 24 hours sleep deprived is the bottom right. So this is going on in every cell in the body, not just in your brain. So your gut has to rest and clean up and clear out bad proteins, fix DNA, fix receptors, <clears throat> get the house in order for the next meal. Your muscle has to do this. Your connective tissue has to do this. Your skin has to do this. Your brain for sure has to do this. Your heart has to do this. If you don't give your body the seven to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep that allows you to go from deep sleep to REM sleep, um, then you, I don't think you can age optimally. It is mandatory. Probably one of the best things I ever did for myself and my family and, you know, hopefully my patients too was when I stopped taking trauma call because that is a form of shift work that just destroys your body and, and your brain. And I didn't want that anymore. And now I'm on a very regular circadian rhythm. I didn't start that way. Certainly residency destroyed me. I mean, we never slept in residency. Um, but over time, I've been able to develop a pretty good sleep habit. It's still not perfect. No, no one's perfect. And I certainly don't get seven to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep every night, but I'm much better than I used to be. And I can tell I feel a lot better. I really rarely ever have pain. Whenever I get injured, it heals pretty quickly. I never get sick. So, you know, what can I say? You got to sleep seven to eight hours uninterrupted. And there's some tricks to how to do that. Next slide. And then socializing. No human being was meant to be isolated. So we saw this with COVID. The forced isolation of people really destroyed a lot of them. Really, it destroyed society. Um, human connection, spirituality, a sense of purpose, all of this is necessary for everything to function properly in your body, believe it or not. The brain responds to these things. Daily wine and laughter amongst Sardinian men helps them with this healthy lifespan. So remember I told you Sardinia was one of the blue zones? They think this is one of the reasons why, because of this sort of cultural phenomenon of daily socializing, chit-chatting, reducing stress, laughing, which there's a whole body of literature on how laughing helps the brain. So all of this is extremely important. And I show you this picture of Notre Dame um, after the fire and, you know, I applaud France for going to the effort they're doing to rebuild that church because it gives that whole society and really the world another sense of connection, spirituality, and purpose, um, you know, whatever your religion is. So all this is extremely important for optimal aging. And then stress optimization. Some stress is good. So like, um, 
going for a run or working out stresses your body and increases the number of reactive oxygen species in your muscle, but those signal protein synthesis and cleanup things. So a certain amount of stress and um, the, the stress molecules triggers activities that we want. The problem is when we have too much stress over too much time, too much cortisol over too much time. We don't want that. So you don't want the elevated cortisol that never, it's supposed to fluctuate. It's supposed to go up in the morning when we wake up and then slowly diminish. Some people it's always up. We don't want that because that induces chronic low grade inflammation and reactive oxygen species. So you want the stress that helps you manage when you get sick, you, you cut your, your forearm and it's bleeding. You want that clot to form, you want it to heal. That's a stress to the system but that's okay. We want, we want that stress to happen because otherwise we would never heal. And then some stress makes you learn better, things like that. But what you don't want is a chronic psychological stress that our society puts on us all the time now. And then I'll tell you that meditation, transcendental meditation in particular, has been proven in studies to reduce all-cause mortality to the tune of, I think, like 20, 30 percent. So in this one study, they looked at about 200 people with hypertension and in one group, they did transcendental meditation, and one they did not. They followed them for eight years, which was pretty long, 18.8 on the max. So eight years average. So the outlier was 18. And then they found that there was a 23% decrease in all-cause mortality, factoring in every other variable, okay? That was the difference that, that it made. Just that 20 minutes a day of deep, like, just de-stressing the brain and, like, having that interoception of sense itself and just kind of calming everything down and inducing parasympathetic tone. 30% decrease in cardiovascular disease. I'll tell you that's better than any drug that I've heard of. And then a 49% decrease in cancer mortality. Imagine that, just 20 minutes a day of transcendental meditation. Now, obviously, that's kind of hard to patent and put in a pill and get insurance to pay for. And I bet if you picked up the phone and called Blue Cross right now, they would laugh at you if you said, I want to get my transcendental meditation covered. But those are the results of that. It is amazing. And then look at the drug treatment for hypertension. 13% decrease in all-cause mortality and 25% decrease in cardiovascular. You can see transcendental meditation is at least as good or better, much safer, no side effects, and pretty cheap. Some people have supplement questions out there. Don't give up. We're going to talk about supplements, so maybe your question will be answered then. It's coming up. So again, strept optimization. So serotonin levels go up. Serotonin is the feel-good molecule in your brain. That's sort of the happy molecule. So people that do transcendental meditation have naturally elevated levels of serotonin. And then the brain waves that are tested with EEG imaging improve. So your, your alpha, theta, beta waves all become beneficial with this sort of stress management. You don't have to do transcendental meditation, prayer works, box breathing, um, just anything that sort of gets you out of your own head like we talked about before. So here, the box breathing we talked about. So and I put this slide up here to show you this is what the Navy SEALs do when they need to manage stress, like before an operation or after. So anytime you do something really stressful, you should probably box breathe after and just sort of get that closure. So I talked about this as in a talk before. You basically inhale through your nose for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, exhale out of your mouth for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, and just repeat that cycle maybe three, four times. And you will be shocked at the amount of... Um, control of your stress that that gives you. So like kids that get stressed out, I like to teach them this technique. Um, there's another one where you inhale, fully inhale and then inhale again and then slowly exhale. So that, just that act of breathing in, breathing in triggers certain circuits in the brain that induce relaxation. So this is just, been, this is not voodoo. This is not hooey stuff. This is not touchy-feely. This stuff really, really works, as does prayer, as does the stress induced by cold plunges, as does the stress induced for the hyperthermia of the, of the sauna, and then again, exercise. All of these are other ways to help manage stress, because if you live your life with too much cortisol, you are destroying yourself. Supplements. So here we go. So these are the supplements, and I take all of these, um, that have been shown to be associated with longevity. And the only one that we left out of here was D3. I will 
just a little caveat, no insurance company is ever going to pay for these, okay? If they're not considered experimental, then they're considered convenience items or wellness items, and no insurance company is going to pay for these. <clears throat> so generally, this is out of pocket, or if you have a condition and your doctor will write a script and you have a health savings account, sometimes you can use that for it. Um, and most of the powerful and traditional players out there are going to discount the benefits of supplements, say it's quackery, poo-poo on it, and, uh, you know, say it's expensive urine, right? I've heard that from doctors before. But I heard the other day, I think it was Mark Hyman said, if that's the case, then why does anybody drink water? Because you pee water out too. So do we not need water as it passes through the body? So my attitude is we need all of this. Sure, some of it might come out in the urine, but so does the water and so does parts and bits and pieces of the food we eat. It doesn't mean that you don't need the certain, the cofactors, the polyphenols, the xenohormesis, the minerals, and other micronutrients to process those 37 billion reactions that happen every second, right? So let's talk about NAD real quickly. This is one of the newest, um, new discovered, it's been around since the earth began, molecule that we know gives better bioenergetics and signals more sirtuin activity and better DNA cleanup and repair, naturally decreases with age. They're still trying to figure out why, probably because of elevated levels of oxidative stress and chronic inflammation over the years. But you can add back the NAD that you're naturally losing. And the best way to do that is NMN, we think, which is a subset of the molecule. So <clears throat> NAD, again, is the shuttle system. So you can see this circle on the right is a Krebs cycle. The circle on the right is the Krebs cycle, which shows um, how glucose goes through certain steps to pull out pyruvate and whatnot, and then electrons are put onto the shuttle system of NADH, which then brings it to the electron transport chain and lets oxidative phosphorylation happen, you form ATP. Can't do it without NAD. There are no bioenergetics, everything will shut down, you will feel like crap without NAD. So the best way to return NAD to the system because it's used up in the process of DNA repair, bioenergetics, is to take NMN because NMN is a molecule in the so-called salvage pathway of forming NAD. Now you can form NAD from things like tryptophan in the diet, but it takes a long, you know, series of steps to do it. And then there's the best way to supplement is not with tryptophan, but it's in one step away from NAD, which is NMN. Then, it, then just one enzyme is needed to convert it. So again, electron movement, and then um, also NAD is a signaler in the body and will turn on and off the sirtuins and whatnot to try to induce better DNA repair and things like that. So you wanna increase your cellular levels of NAD by taking NMN or nicotinamide mononucleotide because you wanna allow more electron energy transfers in a more efficient manner. And then you wanna have more sirtuin activation. By result of that, you want healthier mitochondria, you want better folded proteins, you want better DNA that doesn't have mutations and has been repaired. Uh, we are assaulted on a daily basis and our DNA is constantly being damaged and mutated. Our body has a way to repair it, but if it doesn't have the energy and the signaling molecules and the properly folded enzymes to repair the DNA, the good histones and things like that, then you can't repair it. And one of the keys to that process is NAD. So I take NMN now every morning um, and I've been feeling a lot better, but I'm really taking it for optimal health and longevity and try to keep my DNA. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so I'm hit by radiation every time I operate. Um, there's a million ways you can have DNA damage. So NMN is one way to help your body repair that damage and also to give you more energy. So less fatigue, you're better able to ha ha um, handle toxins, you're better, better able to handle exogenous or outside assaults. So ionizing radiation, gamma radiation, pollution, bad water, heavy metal, you know, lead in the water or whatever. All of that damages intracellular functionality and molecules, but it's all fixable, but you have to have the energetics for it and the signaling and NAD is key. So that's why I take NMN. We have a topical question. He's 55. He's a good test driver in Dallas. He walks about 36,000 steps a day, 12 to 13 hour days. He's a decent patient. He's recovering. He's looking at a lot of our stuff. I was just wanted to know if you think it would be beneficial to start with the longevity series now. Okay, so this is a gentleman who works for UPS and walks, I think he said 3,600 steps a day, 36,000 steps a day, which is awesome. Um, 
and then uses his weekend to sort of rest and recover. He takes a lot of our supplements already. He wants to know, should he start the longevity? I would say yes, because by definition, none of us have enough NAD. And then I'll, we'll get into resveratrol and such whatnot. It sounds like you're taking care of yourself. So you probably are going to have a good, long, nice life. So why not keep all your energy and repair the DNA while you can? Um, I'm taking it for those reasons. I don't exercise as much as you, it sounds like. I wish I did. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I would tell you when you say you recover on the weekends, I would just make sure you try to keep the same schedule even on the weekends. So the people that like wake up early during the week and go to bed early just for work, and then they stay up really late and sleep in on the weekends, you are effectively putting yourself into a jet lag situation, which the body hates and nothing works right. So myself, I don't change my schedule. So I wake up at five during the week. I try to wake up five, 5.30 on the weekend. Sometimes I'll push it to six, but I really don't try to sleep in because it's just, there's too much evidence that it's not good for you. So I would say whatever your weekend recovery thing is, try to keep your same schedule. Um, maybe incorporate a little bit of time restricted eating. Um, you know, as long as you can do it and still maintain energy with your job, which you will be able to. And then, yeah, I would start the NMN because it's it's going to you're just going to feel better. It's going to give you the, the currency that your body needs to get things done. All right. So we talked about the metabolism. So the, this shows you that NAD starts with tryptophan, which pretty sure you can find like turkey foods like that. And then it gets converted through a series of steps to nicotinamide, to NMN, to NAD plus. <clears throat> OK, which is the the element that when you add, when you um, reduce it, you'll get NADH, right? So the electrons either add on or pull off. So it just shuttles them around and that changes you from NAD to NADH. So NMN is a salvage pathway, which is shown in the block on the right. So the de novo means, you know, of new, so made from the building block of tryptophan, but you can salvage it, the body recycles it because we just need too much of it. It's used in every cellular process all the time. And there's just no way we would ever be able to eat enough food to get the NAD that we need to, to be alive and function. So the body has built in what's called a salvage pathway or a recycling pathway. So NMN drops it in at the top of that recycling pathway. Um, and that's just, and they just recently, a paper just recently came out showing an NMN receptor. So we know that it can be pulled into the cell and utilized. Um, and the question, there's still some ongoing research being done on does it turn into nicotinamide alone or will it still go all the way through to NAD, depending on dosing or things like that. Nicotinamide you don't want, that does the opposite of NMN. So you want to make sure you're just getting NMN to NAD. All that work's being done, but by and large, the animal studies are very clear, the preclinical studies, and a, a lot of the work being done on humans now is showing that, that this is probably the way to go. And then, of course, NAD, not only does it shuttle electrons and act as a currency to get electrons from the Krebs cycle to the ATP cycle so that you can have bioenergetics, but it is actually a signaling molecule too. So as levels go up, so too do the sirtuin levels go up. And then the energy can be used for DNA repair, but you'll still have enough energy left over for other functionality. So it'll induce um, certain elements that cause all of this acetylation, the histones to work, and the DNA to repair. Very, very important. And you have to have enough energy to do it all. So if your sirtuins sense a lot of DNA damage, they're just going to be spinning their wheels trying to clean that up. Meanwhile, other DNA is getting damaged and you're not making energy for the cell and you're not cleaning up the mitochondria. So you have to have enough NAD for the sirtuins to function and the bioenergetics of the cell to function. So that's why levels of NAD are so important. Omega-3. So the blue zone populations have a much higher omega-3 content than we do. There's actually studies, I think Bill Harris put these out, and actually he has a company that'll test this. The omega-3 index of your red blood cells are omega-3, and this is the overall levels of omega-3 that sit in the red blood cell, okay? The Japanese omega-3 index we think is at about 8%. The best Americans are at 5%. Most of us are at 1% to 2%. So we think that omega-3 is strongly correlated with health, longevity, better brain function, better cognitive function, better moods, less depression, and uh, just better overall functionality of the cell. And it's also been associated with a lower um, RDW, which is a, the, the size change of your red blood cells. So it helps maintain consistent cell sizing, which makes functionality better too. Um, 
I would like to do a whole talk just on omega-3s. They are so important to everything, and we just don't get enough in our American world. All the cattle and all the chicken are fed omega-6 corn and soy, and then that translates down the food chain to us. All of the oils you eat are very high in omega-6, most of them. Um, most of the wild-caught fish are high in omega-3, but most of the fish we get at the grocery store are now farm-raised, which are fed, guess what? The same thing they feed feedlot cattle basically. So the, the fish is starting to be high in omega-6. So you want a good omega-3 to 6 ratio so that your cell membranes are fluid. The receptors work better. The ion channels work better. You want to put DHA in the brain to build the cells of um, the neural the neural function in the, in the brain. So remember when your mom told you fish food was brain food or fish was brain food? It's very, very true. And omega-3s are the key to that. So I personally am shooting for the Japanese index level or more. Um, I take five grams of omega-3 a day. So you probably want to check with your physician, of course. I'm not dispensing medical advice. But I started doing that this year. And I, I've, I've noticed a definite change. And I feel better. And I've had less stress. My mood is better. And I just feel better. Um, and I know that it's going to help me for optimal life later. And then the fatty acid outcomes research study. So this is a big study. They looked at 42,000 people or so and followed them for about 16 years. Over that time span, about 15,000, 16,000 of them passed away. And they found that the ones with the highest EPA and DHA levels, like in the 90th percentile, 13% lower risk of death than those in the 10th percentile. So that's not to be sniffed at. If a drug can give you a 10% longer life or a 10% chance of living longer, that would be a blockbuster drug. Um, but of course, this isn't because it's a natural product found in nature. Um, therefore, nobody talks about it. But I think the omega-3 index is massively important. It increases your neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, which, which is a measure of your innate to adaptive immunity. So it'll improve your immune function as well. Um, if you're super stressed out, you get a bad ratio. If you're critically ill, you get a worse ratio. If you're super healthy, your ratio is about one to one to three. So omega-3s help get that ratio to a good point where you have enough natural killer cells to go out and attack the badness and then to convert to a pro-resolvin or healing phase. So I've talked about this before. The omega-3 byproducts of the inflammatory pathway are called resolvins, pro-resolvins, things like that. They stop that damaging inflammatory kill, kill, kill pathway, which the natural killer cells and the innate immune system do, and convert it into the pathway that starts the healing and rebuilding. If you don't have enough omega-3, you got too much omega-6, all of that pathway is the damaging arachidonic acid pro-inflammatory pathway. So omega-3 is hugely important for immune function too. So you want a good neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. You want a lot of pro-resolving molecules. You don't want a lot of inflammatory molecules. And the way to do that is to take more omega-3s. You can go on. Resveratrol. This is one of my favorites. Um, resveratrol was found to have anti-cancer activity, I mean, at least as far back as 1997 in Science, which is a great journal. It has been shown to have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, immunomodulator, glucose regulatory, neuroprotective, cardiovascular protective, and generally protective against most non-communicable diseases. So things like diabetes, cancer, arthritis, connective tissue disorders, things like that, that are all because of chronic inflammation and oxidative stress. Resveratrol has been shown to have amazing properties to prevent all that. It also at low doses will act as its own sort of single molecule electron acceptor antioxidant. At higher doses, it's an indirect antioxidant because it upregulates your own antioxidants. So it'll upregulate the production of catalase, glutathione, glutathione dismutase, all of these um, innate enzymes you have in your body that take out reactive oxygen species. Resveratrol has also been the first molecule that was shown to upregulate sirtuin-1 and to increase longevity that way. So it's been proven in animals, work's being done in humans now. What has been proven in humans is it improves cognition, reduces episodes of cognitive de decline, reduces deposition of abnormal proteins in the body and the brain, um, and generally helps with most of the functionality in terms of better immune function, less chronic inflammation, and less oxidative stress. And it activates AMPK. So resveratrol is a component of the fast mimicking diet. So you can actually 
eat certain things and actually mimic the effects of time-restricted feeding or calorie re restriction because you can upregulate your own AMPK. Resveratrol is one of them. We're going to talk about another one in a minute. So it increases your CERT1, your NRF2, which is another pro-healing anti-inflammatory um, gene transcription factor, and it decreases mTOR. Remember, I told you too much mTOR is not compatible with optimal long health span. So resveratrol is pretty awesome. I take about 1,000 milligrams a day. Oh, we have a question. Okay. This is resveratrol okay to take when I've had breast cancer, estrogen, and progesterone positive? Is resveratrol okay with estrogen and progesterone positive breast cancer? I'm pretty sure the literature supports an anti-cancer benefit of resveratrol to breast cancer. Um, so I think it's okay. Of course, you got to check with your oncologist. Now, whether your oncologist knows anything about supplements, I don't know. But they're using resveratrol now in some trials to um, enhance and support the chemotherapy regimen that people are on uh, because it it's so antioxidant, so it helps protect the other normal cells. And then it'll, of course, upregulate all of the what we call the stress um, molecules, so the AMPKs and the sirtuins. I don't think it has any actual um, hormonal receptor activity, so it should be okay. Um, but again, check with your physician. But, but people are using resveratrol as an anti-cancer drug these days. Well, not drug. I, shouldn't, I can't say that. I'll get my wrist slap for saying drug, but it's been, it's been helpful as an augment. Okay. So remember I told you we're going to talk about something else that upregulates AMPK. And we talked about before how metformin is being taken in the anti-aging community. And there's actually a huge study the NIH actually funded uh, called the TAME study. And, it and it's a metformin as a, as a age management drug. And the reason this all started is because more and more studies <clears throat> were found looking at diabetics and noting that they had the ones that were on metformin did better in every parameter. So they had less cancer. They had less heart disease. They lived longer. They uh, had less arthritis. They had less pain. They generally felt better. So metformin was some kind of wonder drug that's just been under the radar for about 60 years. And then people started to figure it out. And it does this because it improves mitochondrial health because it upregulates AMPK. So it's like a fasting mimicker, right? So if you calorie restrict, your AMPK is going to go up and you're going to induce sirtuins and the cleanup processes of the cell and DNA repair and whatnot. Metformin does the same thing. Well, guess what else does it? Berberine. So this is a substance that is natural and is almost, in its effects, almost identical to metformin. So... You know, nowadays, you don't want to take a medicine and have it on your medical record like metformin because everything is public. Don't think it's not. The insurance companies are buying your data. Everybody's buying your data. And so if, if you take metformin for longevity or to try to live longer and prevent cancer, some life insurance company is going to deny you life insurance because they say you're diabetic. Well, the way around that is berberine. So berberine will lower your cholesterol, just like metformin has been shown to. That was reported in 1989 first. And then in 2004, it was shown in real life. It lowers your LDL levels. So why does everybody, the number one prescribed drug is statins, right? Berberine does the same thing. It lowers your total cholesterol, lowers your triglycerides. Guess what else lowers your triglycerides? Omega-3s. It activates AMPK, which means it's going to improve the bioenergetics of your cell. And then by virtue of activating AMPK, it's going to activate the sirtuins, which are going to help with the DNA repair and DNA methylation or deacetylation. And it's just going to make everything work better for you. And then, of course, because it's acting like metformin, it's going to lower your serum glucose. So it, indu it, it improves your insulin sensitivity. So like people in PCOS, things like that, where they have insulin resistance or people with straight up insulin resistance, berberine is probably a good... Um, product to start with. And so because of all that, of course, it's going to help with weight loss. So I've actually prescribed metformin and, and I've tried to prescribe other drugs like the GLP-1 inhibitors or Ozempic, things like that, to help people with weight loss. Because if you can just get your body into that stress state or pull the glucose out of the blood and get it in the cell and start getting it to be used, as opposed to going to forming fat, people will lose weight. So a lot of work is being done looking at berberine as a weight loss supplement. Um, but of course, you can't sit on your couch and eat Cheetos till midnight, wake up at six and not exercise, and then expect to lose weight just because you take berberine. 
it works better with a good circadian rhythm, a better diet, and a little bit of exercise, obviously. But guess what? Every single drug that's approved on the market for weight loss, the, the labeling always says with a good diet and with exercise. So I love berberine. I think it's great. You do want to start off slow with it and probably talk to a physician because some people, it really controls blood glucose so much that it just makes them, they have to get used to that. Um, so it is a potential diabetes treatment. There is a 2014 study looking at it for that reason. Um, a lot of people will take it after a meal, particularly a meal that they know will spike their glucose. And again, when I say a lot of people, I'm talking about people heavy into wellness and anti-aging. Um, and it, essentially it's comparable to metformin. So berberine is a great longevity molecule because it's going to increase your AMPK, which in turn will increase your CERT. Resveratrol increases your CERT levels and helps reduce, um, the, the propensity of tumor cells to evolve. So does berberine. Berberine helps to control the cholesterol levels, the total cholesterol, the triglycerides. Omega-3 gets you into a healing pro-resolving, not pro-inflammatory state, keeps everything flexible, keeps the cell membranes working well, and then also lowers triglycerides. All of these things work together. Most of the studies that poo-poo vitamins I've found look at a single molecule at a low dose and that's it. They don't look at the big picture. Just like that would be like saying the Mediterranean diet doesn't work because they studied taking two tablespoons of olive oil and nothing changed. Well, it's not just the olive oil. It's the olive oil, it's the omega-3s, it's the polyphenols, it's the micronutrients, it's the minerals, it's the fiber, it's the socializing, it's the exercise, it's the everything. So this is a whole lifestyle change. So you can't just take NMN and think your world is gonna turn around. You need to combine it with all these other things and a better lifestyle. And again, if you're gonna start with anything, get your sleep house in order. Once you get your sleep in order, then start doing these other things. It would be my first bit of advice. But right now I'm, I'm taking, based on all the science I've read and all the research I've done, NMN, berberine, resveratrol, quercetin, which is in our, our formulation with D3. D3, I take about 5,000 international units a day now. Um, and I went from, I was deficient. I was at 16. Now I'm up to 44 and I'm going to recheck it again soon. Optimal, you want to be around 50 or 60. Remember all those levels that we, that are normal. Like when you go to your doctor's office and they say, oh, you're 30 on your vitamin D, you're normal. Well, that's the level set by the government to not get rickets and, you know, to not die. So like just being severely deficient, the government does not care about optimal health. So they're never going to give you that RDA for optimal health. That's where the wellness world and functional medicine, nutrition, all that stuff comes into play. So D3, you really don't want it 30. In fact, they've shown that the people with the higher D3 levels, we'll talk about COVID real quick, people with the higher D3 levels, 100% of them did not go to the hospital, did not have problems. Sort of mid-range, fewer went to the hospital and had problems. The people at the low end, 70% of them went to the hospital and a lot of them didn't make it. So D3 was highly correlated with outcomes. Um, and I just think D3 should be one of your fundamental basic building blocks for optimal aging, along with all these other things we're talking about now, omega-3, berberine, NMN, resveratrol, quercetin. So quickly about quercetin, this is a bioflavonoid. So that is a plant hormesis, xenohormesis molecule. So it's a molecule made by plants to sort of protect themselves and their stress response molecule. And because the earth is one thing, right? And we all share molecules and kind of all evolve together. And we breathe the same air. We can use these plant molecules to better ourselves. And quercetin is one of them. Very antioxidant, anti-thrombotic, meaning it helps prevent blood clots. Anti-carcinogenic, there's another one. And neuroactive. It activates a certain pathway in the body that's very pro-healing and anti-inflammatory, the NRF2 pathway. And that's also the pathway that caloric restriction activates, by the way. Promotes autophagy. We talked about that before. That's when you go in and clean up the damaged mitochondria, you fix the damaged DNA, you get rid of the bad proteins. So autophagy, it's, it's self-eating. So you want to get rid of and clean up and recycle the bits and pieces and parts of damaged cells and damaged DNA, right? We don't want that hanging around. And then it inhibits TNF-alpha activation. TNF-alpha is one of the cytokines that is um, highly inflammatory, so elevated in a lot of autoimmune disorders. So quercetin is great for those kind of problems, as is omega-3. Actually, omega-3 has been studied in a lot of um, rheumatoid arthritis studies as an adjunctive treatment to make the medications traditionally prescribed for that autoimmune work even better. So all of these are going to help you really with any condition almost. And then 
Quercetin was found to be a senolytic. Remember I talked about killing off senescent zombie cells with senolytics when added to desatinib, which is, which is a biologic drug, right? A pharmaceutical drug. But that combination got rid of senolytic cells. A lot of people don't take it before exercise because it actually is so powerful in terms of antioxidant, it actually decreases the stress response to exercise. Remember I told you you want a little bit of reactive oxygen species after you exercise to induce the signaling that, that evolves into protein synthesis and the benefits of exercise. Um, they've actually shown resveratrol at low dose in, in middle-aged people, like 30 or so. If you, if you take too little of it before exercise, the same thing happens. It blunts the response of exercise. So if you know you're going to go for a hard workout, maybe don't take a ton of an antioxidants right before it because you want the body to sense a little bit of stress. And then quickly, we'll just talk about epigenetics. So this is what we talked about before. So you know when you meet people and you're like, wow, you don't look your age, or gosh, you look so young. That's a real thing. Because your chronological age, your time age, does not have to match your biological age. And now we have a way to measure this, thanks to a lot of work that's been done at very high levels of basic science. And like I said, Steve Horvath came out with one of the first ones. So you can look at the number of methylations. and they've because what happened is they figured out how much DNA is methylated over time looking at DNA. And then they could look at somebody and say, oh, the average 30-year-old at this time has this, this many DNAs are methylated, this many are unmethylated, and here's where you line up with that person. So like if you're 50 and you match a 30-year-old, great, but some 30-year-olds are going to match a 50-year-old, not so great. But you can measure these things. And they've actually started to do studies not, uh, now to try to reverse it, to take you from 50 to 40 or from 40 to 35. And one of the studies looked at treating with growth hormone, DHEA, and metformin. And they actually reversed epigenetic aging. Now, this was, of course, preclinical, so it does, doesn't mean run out and go start taking all of this. But the work is being done now, and it's pretty amazing, the science behind it. But every single one of these life... Um, anti-aging or longevity scientists, they all time restrict their feeding, I'm pretty sure. They all eat healthy. They all maintain a good weight. They all exercise and they all try to get good sleep. So you, you can't forget the basics. You can't build a house just with the windows, right? You got to have the whole, everything, the whole package. But um, it is pretty cool how we're trying to figure out how to reverse the aging. And then the TAME study, that's that metformin um, study we talked about. And that is ongoing right now. Yeah, we have a sleep question. So the question is, uh, uh, somebody's husband had rotator cuff surgery and is, I guess, so the surgery's done, but he's still having trouble sleeping, I guess, because it hurts at night, and is taking turmeric and tart cherry and PEA, which is palmitoyl ethanolamide, which reduces inflammation on nerve endings. So it'll reduce pain. Um, <clears throat> should he be taking anything else? Uh, well, the first thing I'd say is, you know, make sure the cuff repair is going well. Hopefully he's in good physical therapy. I've actually had people where I've had them sleep in the uh, brace that you wear after a rotator cuff surgery, um, even if they haven't had surgery or if it's well after surgery, just because it keeps the arm in a certain position and doesn't let you roll over it. I think personally being my experience is most people will roll over at night and sleep on their side and pull an arm like this, which slides the scapula forward and puts the cuff in a sort of disadvantage, like a bad position. Um, and that brace kind of doesn't allow that to happen and kind of puts it in a best position for healing. Um, say maybe try some omega threes, like, I've been putting a lot of my patients on three to four grams a day now for arthritic or connective tissue pain because it is just so beneficial to connective tissue and so anti-inflammatory. And it also improves mood. Pain is highly correlated with mood. Um, so omega-3 is a great adjunct you could add to that. And then, of course, topicals. But maybe think about the brace. But probably it sounds like you need to make sure that the cuff repair went well or the therapy is going well. But yeah, those physical impediments to sleep are problematic, agreed. So maybe keep the shoulder in one position. Um, I'm not suggesting sleeping in a uh, recliner. A lot of people do that, and that's like one of the worst things you can do um, in terms of sleep quality. And then the other things, make sure the room is super dark. Make sure the temperature is 65 degrees or so. Make sure no blue light was looked at within a few hours of sleep, et cetera, et cetera.
the omega-3. And then, so my omega-3 is the nervous system multi. That's where our omega-3 is housed right now. We're about to come out with a single source product. Um, for real chronic pain, I mean, I've prescribed plenty of medical marijuana to people. Delta-8 is a good alternative for that over the counter, but it will show up positive in a test. Tart cherry is extremely anti-inflammatory and acts like Celebrex, but without all of the side effects of Celebrex. So that's a great adjunctive for um, pain, I think. Um, and then I think just basic things, you know, everybody forgets ice, which helps in alternating heat and ice because the heat will induce healing and blood flow. Ice calms it all down and numbs things up. But I would add omega-3 to tart cherry, I think, maybe consider delta-8. So the DNA methylation clock, so back to the science, we want to stop this clock and reverse it, right? So a little bit is going to be your genes, but as we talked about, most of it is you. So the range is 10 to 20% is not in your control. That means 80 to 90% is in your control. So think about that. The power is with you and what you do, what you put in your mouth, when it goes in your mouth, how you sleep, when you sleep, things like that, and if you exercise. So don't be de depressed and think like I just have bad genes. You can fix almost most of your all of your problems yourself with better diet and better lifestyle and then the supplements like we talked about. We have a, we have another question. Uh, the, lo the longevities are better in the morning, um, with the exception maybe a berberine, which maybe you could take twice a day if you can tolerate it. And again, I like I said, a lot of people take that after a meal to, to pull the glucose out of the system. But naturally, your NAD cycle is such that you have more in the system in the morning to support the day, again, going with that circadian rhythm. And the same with resveratrol. So I take them in the morning because that's when they should be taken. Um, and they do better in fat. So I take them with whole milk yogurt, Greek yogurt, unsweetened. Like, so just, I try to, it's a little bit of yogurt. So technically it could break a fast, but I don't really care about that because I want these things to be absorbed properly. So just a little bit of yogurt. And that's really all I have in the morning. And I, and I add the omega threes for that fat too. That oil will help it absorb. The question is, is it possible to reverse nerve damage from a car accident? Well, that's kind of a big question because I don't know which nerve, when, yada, yada, et cetera. But yeah, in general, the body has a massive and remarkable ability to heal itself if you give it a chance. So nerves, uh, the B vitamins are super important for nerve function. We have a B gummy. CoQ10 is uh, one of the electron transporters for the electron transport chain and a massive antioxidant that will help nerve function better. Omega-3s we talked about um, for brain health and nerve, nerve system health. <clears throat> PEA reduces inflammation around nerve endings, reduces the mast cells, which is one of the um, immune cells from releasing all of their inflammatory mediators. So it reduces mast cell degranulation around nerve cells. Um, so all of those will help. And then I think just eating a really good, healthy diet and getting sleep. The only way nerves can heal is if you sleep. Um, and if you have a fasted state, that's when all repair processes happen. So um, we, we'll have to do a talk on the circadian rhythm, I think, coming up, because there's just so much data out there now. Um, but I think that's going to be, in the future, one of the most understood and given things like it's going to just be everybody's going to be on a good schedule because it's so obvious now now that they've discovered the mechanisms why we have a circadian rhythm and how it plays into every single body part to include the repair system and especially the immune system okay somebody just asked if i favor intermittent fasting or eating twice a day um, yeah, we talked about time-restricted feeding quite a bit. There's a bunch of different ways to go about it. Intermittent fasting technically is like when you don't eat for one day a week or you don't eat for two days a week or you do a prolonged fast. I am more of a fan of time-restricted eating based on the circadian clock or the daily clock. So um, I do a 10-14 schedule myself or try to. And of course, I take my NMN resveratrol with a little bit of yogurt in the morning. Um, but um, 
yeah, you have to be fasted at some point during the day or you're never going to trigger the AMPK, the sirtuins. You're never going to diminish the mTORs. The DNA repair processes aren't going to happen. And all this damage is just going to escalate and escalate and escalate. So it is important to um, have that time period that brings out the stress response molecules and allows the body to heal. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of it. We're just checking questions. So basically, in a nutshell, try to sleep better if you can. That's your number one thing. Zone two cardio, 30 minutes a day, four days a week if you can, more if you can. Um, if you have access to sauna or cold plunge, that stress response is very, very beneficial. Try to get out in real sunlight. 30 minutes a day if you can. That's been shown to reduce pain, improve mood. And if you do it in the morning, it triggers all of the circadian clock set, um, genes to turn on at the appropriate time because the melatonin shuts down and cortisol goes up when it's supposed to and then diminishes when it's supposed to. Try not to stimulate yourself with coffee after like lunchtime or anything like that. And then give yourself the fuel to replace what is going down with age, like the NMN to replace your NAD, berberine to upregulate your AMPK and CERT1, and resveratrol to upregulate your CERT1 and fast mimic. So all of these are just tips and tricks. But, you know, thinking you're going to live four years longer when you're 80 doesn't really mean a lot. It's kind of esoteric. It's kind of nebulous. But everything you do to do that makes you feel better today. It makes you more productive, a better family member, a better friend, and just makes your life better. I mean, why do we want to live in this processed food, poor sleep, horrible, miserable way we live in this country? It can be so much better, and it's all in our power. I think that we're, we have another question. Oh, okay. Density. Oh, okay. Somebody asked, what do I mean by 1014 for, for time restricted? So I try to stop eating by 8 p.m. And, you know, technically, Dr. Sachin Panda would tell you that you don't want to eat within two to three hours of sleep. That's kind of hard for me, just the way, you know, when I get home from work and stuff like that. So I try to stop putting anything in my mouth except water at eight or around then, and then try to fall asleep by like 9.30 or 10. Um, and then I don't, except for the, um, the yogurt with the NMN and the resveratrol and the omega threes in the morning, I don't eat till about 10. So that means 14 hours of fasting time more or less. And of course I'm not perfect, but that, that means that my body has time to get everything out of the gut so the gut can rest. So your gut biome becomes healthy and then the rest of the body can repair and pull out damaged proteins out of the brain, et cetera. So some people do 16 hours. I find that ridiculous for me in my life and impossible, so I'm never going to do that. Some people do 12 and 12, which is also acceptable. For shift workers, it's really hard to time this, but if you can do it and you can try to eat when it's daytime, in, that's even better. The, the shift work research has yet to be done, but I think that's going to be hugely important for the world because I really feel terrible for anybody on shift work because I just, every time I see them, I know that their life has been shortened just by the nature of their job. But anyway, so 10 to 14 is 8 p.m. till 10 a.m. for me. So I eat from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., if that makes sense. Okay, we're going to have a giveaway for the people that ask questions. There's a giveaway. D Doug is going to get the giveaway. So we will send it to Doug. The only other thing I want to tell you about the resveratrol and the NMN is keep them, once you, when you get them, put them in the fridge. They'll last longer. Um, and, you know, the molecular structure will be stable. We put them in brown bottles on purpose to block UV rays, but keeping them in the fridge makes them last even longer. Same with omega-3, by the way. And that's it. Everybody go enjoy your, uh, what is today, Saturday.